Herr Präsident, der Deutsche Bundestag heißt Sie herzlich willkommen. Es ist uns eine Ehre und Freude, den Präsidenten der Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika an dieser ehrwürdigen Stätte des deutschen Parlamentarismus zu begrüßen. Die Stadt Frankfurt und der Oberbürgermeister werden es mir nicht übel nehmen, wenn ich hinzufüge, dass wir sie freilich noch lieber willkommen heißen würden in der Mitte des Deutschen Reichstages zu Berlin. Herr Präsident, hier in dieser Paulskirche trat 1848 die erste deutsche Nationalversammlung zusammen unter der Losung »Das ganze Deutschland soll es sein«. Mr. President Kissinger, Chancellor Erhardt, Minister President Zinn, Mayor Buckelman, ladies and gentlemen. I am most honored, Mr. President, to be able to speak in this city before this audience. For in this hall, I am able to address myself to those who lead and serve all segments of the democratic system. Mayors, governors, members of cabinets, civil servants, and concerned citizens. As one who has known the satisfaction of the legislator's life, I am particularly pleased that so many members of your Bundestag and Bundesrat are present today. For the vitality of your legislature has been a major factor in your demonstration of a working democracy a democracy worldwide in its influence. In your company also are several of the authors of the Federal Constitution who have been able, through their own political service, to give a new and lasting validity to the aims of the Frankfurt Assembly. 115 years ago, a most learned parliament was convened in this historic hall. Its goal was a united German Federation. Its members were poets and professors and lawyers and philosophers and doctors and clergymen, freely elected in all parts of the land. No nation applauded its endeavors as warmly as my own. Because they said a German problem. Today there are ex no exclusively German problems or American problems, or European problems. There are world problems. And our two countries and continents are inextricably bound together in the tasks of peace as well as war. We are partners for peace, not in a narrow bilateral context, but in a framework of Atlantic partnership. The ocean That is why our nations are working together to strengthen NATO, to expand trade, to assist the developing countries, to align our monetary policies, and to build the Atlantic community. I would not diminish the miracle of West Germany's economic achievements, but the true German miracle has been your rejection of the past for the future, your reconciliation with France your participation in the building of Europe, your leading role in NATO, and your growing support for constructive undertakings throughout the world. For 18 years, the United States has stood its watch for freedom all around the globe. The firmness of American will and the effectiveness of American strength 
have been shown in support of free men and free governments in Asia, in Africa, in the Americas, and above all, here in Europe. It is in the interest of us all for war in Europe, as we learned twice in 40 years, destroys peace in America. A threat to the freedom of Europe is a threat to the freedom of America. That is why no administration, no administration in Washington can fail to respond to such a threat, not merely from goodwill, but from necessity. And that is why we look forward to a united Europe in an Atlantic partnership, an entity of interdependent parts sharing equally both burdens and decisions and linked together in the task of defense as well as the arts of peace. But purpose of our common military effort is not war, but peace. Not the destruction of nations, but the protection of freedom. The forces that West Germany contributes to this effort are second to none among the Western European nations. Your nation is in the front line of this defense, and your divisions, side by side with our own, are a source of strength to us all. For we live in a world, for we live in a world in which our own united strength will and must be our first reliance. As I have said before and will say again, we work towards the day where there may be real peace between us and the communists, but, and we will not be second in that effort, but that day is not yet here. We in the United States and Canada see 200 million people, and here on the European side of the Atlantic Alliance, 300 million people. The strength and unity of this half billion human beings are and will continue to be the anchor of all freedom for all nations. Let us from time to time pledge ourselves again to our common purpose, but let us go on from words to actions to intensify our efforts for still greater unity among us, to build new associations and institutions on those already established. Lofty words cannot construct an alliance or maintain it. Only concrete deeds can do that. The great present task of construction, but by hope and purpose as well. For we know now that freedom is more than the rejection of tyranny, that prosperity is more than an escape from want, that partnership is more than a sharing of power. These These are, above all, great human adventures. They must have meaning and conviction and purpose. And because they do, in your country and in mine, in all the nations of the Alliance, we are called to a great new mission. It is not a mission of self-defense alone, for that is a means, not an end. It is our large and menacing Yet the goals of a peaceful world, today and tomorrow, must shape our decisions and inspire our purposes. So we are all idealists. We are all visionaries. Let it not be said of this Atlantic generation that we left ideals and visions to the past, nor purpose and determination to our adversaries. We have come too far. We have sacrificed too much to disdain the future now, and we shall ever remember what Goethe told us, that the highest wisdom, the best that mankind ever knew, was the realization <laughs> the highest wisdom and the best that mankind ever knew was the realization that he only earns his freedom and existence who daily conquers them anew. <laughs>